All right, everybody, if you want to come on in and find a seat, um, feel free if you get hungry and need a snack to help yourself uh, to the dessert table or if you need coffee, we have decaf and tea in the back. Um, there's also, I just want to point out, um, Dr. Cox has brought a book table. He's written several really great books. Um, so in the, uh, any of the breaks, you might want to head back there and check those out. And uh, I want to especially welcome those of you who are visiting um, our church who are not part of Christ the King. We're really glad to have you here. Um, just so you know, the restrooms are located kind of down that hall. There are some downstairs if you want to go down there, but the nicer restrooms are up here at the top. Um, just go down that hallway. Um, just uh, They'll be on your right just down that hall. Um, I, uh, I was just asking uh, Dr. Cox how he would like me to introduce him. We have introduced him twice here at our church. He came in 2016 and 2017, did Marriage 1.0 and uh, a parenting conference for us, um, which I was telling him uh, before uh, we started that uh, we, we were really excited about that in the Sutton household because uh, on his podcast, he actually has the recording of our church's version of that <laughs> conference, and my wife asked a question about two of our boys, and he referred to them affectionately as itchy and scratchy, <laughs> which, uh, which is how we refer to them now to this day, of course. <laughs> so, um, so I don't think Dr. Cox needs a, a real introduction um, for our congregation, but just so the rest of you know, he's an accomplished psychologist, an author, um, a, uh, a national um, speaker who speaks uh, all over the place. And um, we're kicking off your conference season this yes, year. Yes, yes, for the, the this fall. Is, this right. is the beginning. Um, so we're real excited to have uh, Dr. Cox back. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be back here with y'all. And it's also so exciting to see how many of y'all brought your spouses here for me to change this weekend. <laughs> um, y'all, it's going to be really neat, you know, to watch them grow. Um, it's it's going to be special time. Um, so how many of y'all were here for ma the, my marriage conference, Finders Keepers, back in, right? And hopefully the rest of y'all have listened to it. But, um, and how many of y'all are um, visitors? Oh, wow, good. I'm a visitor, too. Welcome. Okay. So um, we did the conference, what I call Finders Keepers, before, which is kind of my basic marriage conference. And this year, I'm getting to do something. I don't get to do this conference but maybe once a year, um, but it's, I really love doing it. It's kind of like, you know, you go to a, a concert, you know, and, you know, um, you know, the Beatles are going to want to, you're going to want them to play a hard day's night, you know, but probably what they want to do is play some of the stuff they've been playing, you know, at home, their own stuff. Uh, this conference is kind of that for me. And in this analogy, I am the Beatles. Okay, but um, <coughs> I originally wrote this conference, though, not for lay people. I originally wrote it for, uh, speaking to ministers, pastors, church leaders, um, RUF leaders, whatever, because I wanted to get them kind of more down and gnarly in terms of how I actually think about marriages, like in my office. This conference is a little more technical. It's harder. It's one of the reasons I told you to go listen to the first conference before you came here because, um, you know, you're going to be asking, wondering, like, why are there not three steps to conflict resolution? And I'm going to be pushing you harder than that. So this conference is a little more like, I'm going to teach you acrobatic flying, and you're going like, I don't know how to take a plane off, you know. That's, that's sort of why the other conference was important, so... Every, most every marriage conference you will go to, including the one that I did before, um, is going to give you kind of a simplified version. I want to give you some steps that you can take home and do today, and that's great. But this conference is a little more oriented toward capturing for people how a real therapist thinks about marriage. You're going to hear the way I talk to my clients in my office. So it's like, this is going to bargain, okay? I don't know how much they charge you for this, but... This is like, you know, free therapy, whatever, right? Now, th that's good news and it's bad news, okay? The bad news is that um, I'm going to be pushing you. I'm going to be teaching you to think about marriage like I've learned to think about it after doing therapy for 40 years, all right? So I'm going to be, uh, that'll be challenging. As challenging to you as 
if one of you taught me, you know, pediatrics or accounting, I'd be like, whoa, all right? But the good news is this is how I really think. I'm not soft peddling you on this one. After helping messy marriages my entire career, actually I started doing my first marriage therapy sessions were when I was still in seminary and I wasn't married yet. So it was, you can imagine the lives I changed, you know. <laughs> so why don't you just go submit to him? That's what the Bible says, you know. Like that. Anyway, um, but yeah, so I'll push you, but it's going to be worth it. This is actually the number one downloaded um, conference on my podcast. And tomorrow, dealing with difficult people, the morning conference, is the number one by far, by twice of any talk I have on my podcast um did we lose our 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 deal what do you think will anyway so instead of talking about the stuff that we usually talk about in like you know run-of-the-mill marriage conferences um if you're kind of tall enough to ride this ride um i'm gonna try to take you downtown into some hard questions we're going to talk about forgiveness like how do you make sense of that we're going to talk about dealing with our spouse or your mom um, or your sassy teenager when people are being jerky and don't care how do you respond to difficult people we're going to talk tonight about making sense of our childhood baggage that we drag into our marriages okay good Y'all start waving at me or something if it goes off again, because I want it up there, all right? So, welcome to John's Marriage Conference on steroids, all right? But, what's the saying? Uh, Faint heart, near one fair lady. So, we're going to do it anyway, okay? So, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do, do this weekend. Tonight, we're going to talk about baggage. And you know what I mean by that. You know how you bring a ton of your own like needs and fears and longings and stuff from childhood and that's going to be in the background of your marriage all the time right you know if you don't know I'm really glad you're here because you're doing it and don't know it okay so that's really important um one of the major reasons that people struggle in their marriages and one of the things that I focus on the most When I do marriage work is the garbage and junk and triggers and needs and unresolved things from my background that I bring into the marriage. And the more heads up you can be on that, trust me. So how do we make sense of the baggage in our marriage and how do we insulate our marriage from and insulate our our spouse from the fact that I'm probably just mad at my mom, you know. Or my dad didn't connect with me, so I need you to really hear my needs all the time. Huh? Ah, I thought somebody was yelling at me. Sorry. All right. So you're doing the baggage thing, whether you know it or not. Let's know it. Okay? Secondly, tomorrow morning. Last time we talked about conflict. But when we talked about it, we talked about it predicated on the belief, the fact that you both were on board, that you were having a disagreement, and you're like, oh, honey, we're fighting again. Let's work this out, okay? In other words, biblically speaking, that you were both repentant, that you were both open to growth and change. This year, we're going to look at something that's a bit of a pet project of mine. And it actually became a pet project of mine because I run into it so much in my office that I had to, like, figure out how I'm going to handle this. And, th- and it's an incredibly powerful tool, and I've never heard anybody else try to talk about it, and I want to write a book about it one day, but I use it in literally half of the marriage work I do, and that is this. What do you do with conflict if you're married to somebody, and this one will have application to not just your spouse especially, like your controlling mom, you know, or your disappointed dad who's still trying to run your life, or your teenager? Um, what do you do with conflict with an individual who doesn't care? In other words, they, they're going to be a jerk, and you say, whoa, and they're like, I'll talk to you any way I want. Or maybe, how do you just deal with a regular person who's having a difficult day and kind of taking it out on you? Bottom line, the question is, how do we make sense, and how do we respond in a godly, Christ-like, life-giving way to difficult people? Okay, Conflict is 
fine if you have two repentant players. And we talked about that last conference. And even though it's not long division, we still screw it up, okay? But what do you do with an aggressive person, with a shamer, with a powder, that whole dynamic? You know, the people who say stuff like, well, you would think that. Or one of my clients who said, like, um, <laughs> her husband said, well, there's some laundry here that needs doing if you're just sitting around, all right? <laughs> or worse than that, um, you know, all of my friends' wives work out. I'm just saying, okay? If that's surprising to y'all, maybe it's just Mississippi people. I don't know. <laughs> I deal with clients who are telling me about jerks they live with all the time, so I'm like, how do you respond to that? You know? All right? So every family has an alpha running things in, some ba in the background, somebody who they're tiptoeing around, or maybe just a regular person, maybe just your spouse, and they're being crabby McGrumpy pants after work one day and taking it out on you. Either way, how do we engage conflict with people who don't really care? Uh, vastly underdeveloped in the Christian community if I might say so. So watch, so come tomorrow and watch the fun unfold, okay? <laughs> so finally tomorrow we're going to unpack forgiveness. This is another something I really wanted to devote a lot of thinking to in my life. Um, another vastly underdeveloped topic within Christian circles, despite the fact that it's very central to our faith, okay? How do we forgive? What do you do when you can't let go of something? Are there times when we don't need to forgive? What's the What's the deal between forgiveness versus reconciliation? What do you do if the perp doesn't care? Blah, 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 blah. I find forgiveness to be this incredibly nuanced, complex process. And most Christians in my office, it's purely kind of from a position of like, well, you're supposed to forgive them, right? Okay. Let's try to broaden that a little, all right? So that's going to be applicable to your romantic relationship and your life. Uh, I was talking to Jeff earlier, and he made an astute observation that this conference especially is a life conference almost as much as a marriage conference. The things we're talking about are going to have impact in terms of the way you deal with things at work or at church or with your kids or your parents or whatever. We're talking about the, um, the hard parts of emotional maturity in relationships, okay? Doesn't that sound like a blast? All right, so that's our weekend. If you want lightweight, Run away, go now. <laughs> I'll, I'll hide. I won't even see you leave. You know, you can run. I won't know, okay? But if you want the real guts of marriage and relationships and kind of how I think about stuff, you know, in the, in the trenches in the office, then we're sad. All we need is a deck of cards, man. So let's get going. Oh, sorry. Y'all will learn this about me. I'm, I'm a 20th century man. I want a dry erase board flicking these slides. It's like I forget. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about baggage. Welcome to Baggage Claim, okay? Let's begin by remembering our 2016 Finders Keepers Conference. You know, the one that you were commanded to listen to. I'm sure you all listened to that one. Anyway, as you recall, in that conference, we talked about how one of the marriage secrets of the universe was realizing that the real problem with marriage really isn't with your marriage, okay? Instead, what I've learned from doing marriage work and being married for way too long, my, my wife and I just celebrated our 40th anniversary. And, uh, yeah, I told her, I said, you know, I, I, it's just like I, it's, it's better than it's ever been, but frankly, when I said till death do us part, I really wasn't thinking I was going to live this long. You know, uh, but 40 years is great, okay? Um, <laughs> but after doing marriage therapy for a really long time, one of the things that I really started to realize what, was that the real problem in marriage is, is not that you married the wrong person or your spouse is a jerk or whatever. The real problem in marriage is, and in a lot of life, and in your spirituality, by the way, is that marriage and life and relating to God and one another requires a lot of emotional, functional, relational abilities like software. And all of us are missing some of them, okay? Remember I used the analogy, I said that being a human being is a little like being a car. Like to be a successful car, you have to be able to do a lot of things. You got to be able to go and you got to be able to turn. You got to be able to stop. And these capacities, these abilities that the car has kind of determine if the car works. So 
If you're a car with no brakes, fine, you're cool, as long as you're like barreling down the freeway of life, okay? But if there's a detour ahead or a traffic jam, you start pumping the brakes, nothing happens, and you run into that key of soul, okay? And you do that even though you didn't want to, by the way, notice. You do that even though you've tried real hard. You do that even though you've, you've prayed about it, and you still do it. Remember we talked about this? The good news in that is that one of the conclusions we made last time was, therefore, the problem in your marriage is not that your spouse is an evil person. It's that you're both missing these abilities. So your wife wants intimacy, right? She wants connection and for you to share your heart. But maybe you were never really taught what it means to really be intimate and share like what it feels like to be you. Like, uh, ladies, you, you, you're at dinner with your husband, and, and you say, honey, what are you thinking right now? And you're thinking he's going to say, I don't know, I was just thinking that, you know, I've got, I've got everything I need right here <laughs> with you. But if you're married to a guy, he's going to go, I, I was just thinking, you know, that pigs are really big. You know, I mean, like, like, like some of them, like, you could ride one of them, you know, they're really, you know, and, and that's kind of what we're looking at, right? When you, you want intimacy, and he's like, well, I want to, you say, I really want to know you. And he's like, well, you know, I like watching, like, like uh, Duke play basketball in my boxers. It's like, you know, I love you too, honey, whatever. <laughs> so anyway, we didn't have this ability to get connected. So we can do that with all of the abilities, which we'll talk about in a second. Maybe your spouse is real demandy, pushy, and you never learn the ability to say no. So they push, they want their way, but you don't really know how to push back, how to exist, how to say this is who I am. So pretty soon you feel like you've disappeared in your marriage. Now that is one of the things we said last time was that's not a marriage problem, that's a you lacking the ability to be you and exist problem, remember? Okay? or shame problems, or emotional management problems. Bottom line was that marriage and relationships depend on these abilities, and what I wanted to do last time was kind of create a collection, a list of what those were, so you could know what they are and have those categories. That's actually the same four categories that I used to write the parenting book, because what do we want to develop in our kids? Good boys and girls? No, I want them to develop the software that not only reflects God's image, but also makes life work. Um, that's kind of the dandy part of being a, an, a, a therapist to adults is you go, oh, this is what an adult that works looks like. So let's like, what is that word? Like deconstruct it. Let's uh, reverse engineer it. Let's reverse engineer a healthy adult. And that'd be a parenting book. Okay. So anyway. So the best news from all of that was that if you have marriage problems, what since you have marriage problems. Um, that's not because you're a horrible person or your spouse is or you married the wrong person or I knew I should have married that bass player or whatever. It's because you're all missing pieces, missing software, and no one is the bad guy. We're just missing software. And we can learn the software. Okay? So good news. All right? That was a lot of what we talked about then. And um, that was a lot of structure for 2016 in the marriage conference. All right? So, what we call those abilities that I was just playing around with, I called them the four eyes, well, actually the five eyes. You know, the ability to be close and intimate, the ability to have identity and a sense of self, the ability to make sense of imperfection and loss, the ability to do emotional management and impulse control, ringing any bells. But the most important one, of course, whether we're talking about our faith or whether we're talking about our marriages or whether we're talking about our parenting, was the fifth I, and that is what I call inability because it starts with an I. And um, God calls it repentance or humility, okay? And that is the ability to say to people who I'm close to, you know what, I can't do this stuff. Will you teach me? Will you help me? I'm broken. I'm fallen, okay? And we said if you looked at this list, you probably saw two or three that you weren't so good at. And I said the advanced students probably saw like eight you weren't so good at. Either way, you're normal, and the problem is not that you have a crummy marriage, it's that you're missing pieces. So here's our question for this year. We have these categories, we have these things we need to develop growing up, we have these uh, software issues. What's going to happen when 
I bring my incomplete junk and baggage, and it meets your incomplete junk and baggage. What happens when my childhood injuries or needs or longings or blind spots run into yours? Because that's in the background of all of our marriages. And I want to give you a category tonight for making sense of that together. All right? One of the biggest dynamics in marriage, one of the primary things that I talk to couples about, they can be coming in going like, well, we can't agree on like what school to pick. But underneath that, almost always, it is so helpful to start realizing, right, y'all can't agree on what school to send your children to, but one of the things we're learning is, dude, you were really shown growing up that making a mistake is the worst thing in the whole world. And, 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 and wife, you were shown that unless you like were supportive of everyone and like never said no, that you were terrible and bad. So we put those two people trying to make a decision together. Whoa. Okay. They don't need somebody to give them school counseling. They need somebody making sense of these missing pieces. That's like one of the number one things I teach couples. And I want you guys to understand it. Welcome to the party. All right. So let's start here. Why do we have all this incompleteness and baggage in the first place? Well, obviously, part of that answer is sin is in the background of that. And sin creates this distortion in everything, all right? Sin is sort of that prism that bends light. Now, what I want us to do is say, yes, right. Now, let's step right behind the prism, and I want to look at all of what it does to the light. I want us to understand what sin does inside of us, because God made us to develop. God made us where we're born, and we don't know very much. In fact, list me all the things that an infant can do, right? And he, as you can read in my best-selling landmark parenting book, Setting Parents Free, kids don't know very much. And in fact, anything they know, they have to learn. They have to learn forgiveness just like they have to learn tying their shoes or spelling. Okay, we learn these things about love and identity and forgiveness and emotional management. And since this is a screwed up world and I hate to be the one to break it to you, but we're all screwed up parents. Okay, but don't feel guilty. You know, the old saying, if you think mama's crazy, you should have met grandma, you know. All right. (laughs) Since that is so, then we all end up. Growing up with blind spots and missing pieces and character software and glitches and longings, okay? And by the way, if you are sitting there now going, oh my gosh, what am I doing to my children? All right, you are who I wrote a book called Setting Parents Free For. Notice the book is not called Raising Great Kids. Uh, It's called (laughs) How to Give Your Kids What They Need and Where to Run When You Drop the Ball. Because I learned in my practice that the biggest issue for parents was they were terrified of messing up their kids, so... Let's put that aside, okay? And let's focus on you and your growth and your marriage tonight, which is really what your kids need anyway, okay? So anyway, we all have these blind spots and glitches and junk, and then we get married. (laughs) And what's going to happen? Cue the suspenseful, dreadful-sounding music. Well, those missing pieces are going to start showing up like the phantom menace in the background of your relationship. Like that thumb that has a cut on it that you bang against every doorpost whenever you walk through. You know how that happens? In other words, and this is one of the most important things you can ever learn in your marriage and our topic tonight. When we have these incomplete glitches and wounds and junk that we bring into our marriage, something in us will feel that missing piece. We'll feel that glitch or that hurt or that owie, and we will do one of two things. No, we will do two of two things. We will, number one, look to our spouse to finally meet that unfulfilled need. I've always wanted to be connected to, and that never happened in my family, so you're going to be the one to understand me. Or our spouse is going to step all over that need. And I'm going to be somebody, my injury is I need lots of affirmation, and she's going to be like, I don't think they, they painted that color's not right at all. We need, and we're going, we're going, no, all right? They're going to trigger us. So this is kind of secret of the universe number one for us this weekend, and that is 
we're going to bring that junk either to try to hope at some level that our spouse is going to meet that need or we're going to watch them step all over it and we're going to go reactive and, you know, bananas, all right? So let's look at them. Number one, something in us is going to inexorably, inevitably long for our spouse to finally meet that need, fulfill that longing. Here's what a couple of my clients have said after kind of getting curious about this. One of them said, I finally realized after really getting honest with myself and like how I feel in my marriage that I really wasn't looking for a romantic relationship. I was some level looking for a healing relationship. Another one said, I realized that I've always wanted that one hole in me filled by that one person, someone who would choose me. And a dude told me, he said, I just want somebody to be happy about me to where it was like I was enough. I was good enough. Now imagine how he feels every time his wife said, oh, you forgot to take the garbage out. Boom, you know. Now why? Just the garbage, but not for him. We're bringing questions from under the surface, and I want you to be thinking about that, all right? So something underneath the surface is looking for some sort of an answer to this core question that we'll talk about in a minute. We're looking for somebody to finally give us a good answer to it. And actually, our culture tells us that's what marriage is supposed to do, right? Complete you? Hello, Jerry Maguire, right? Think about every Meg Ryan movie, okay? (laughs) She's adorable and intelligent and cute, but she's alone, okay, except for maybe a golden retriever or something. And um, all of her cynical single friends are like, give it up. There are no good guys out there, but she doesn't give up. And there's a guy, and he starts emailing her, or he has a, a, a bookstore down the street, or uh, he's an angel, or he's from another, <laughs> he's from another, they're all the same movie, right? <laughs> or he's a platonic boyfriend, but could that work, you know? It's the same movie. And so by the end of the movie, she's adorable and she's intelligent with that great little haircut and the golden retriever, and she's in love. Okay, and that's every movie, right? And something in us is like, yeah, okay. No wonder we're all disappointed, right? (laughs) What is it? My wife says, um, uh, men marry women hoping they'll never change, but they do. And women marry men hoping they will change, and we don't. (laughs) That was either Norma or Einstein. I'm not sure, but, you know, Norma, Einstein, Einstein, Norma, whatever. It's kind of, you know, I get get them confused. So we think at some level marriage is going to be this place where I'm finally going to get the freedom, the the love, the connection, the belonging that I've always wanted. It's kind of like a do-over, right? Wrong. It doesn't work, and I'm going to tell you why in just a second. Um, Maybe not in a second, but in a minute, all right? The other thing we do with our baggage is our spouse is going to trigger it. In other words, not only are they not going to meet that need, ah, at last, they're going to step all over it, all right? So let's say your baggage is you need to feel like you're good enough, that you make people happy, that you're impressive and you please them, okay? And so your wife starts talking about her friend. His husband makes a zillion dollars. And you know, I can't believe it. They're going to Paris again this year. And you know they got a new place out on Amelia Island that's just supposed to be amazing. She's got a decorator from Garden and Dunn doing it, right? And something in you, and you can't quite put your finger on it, but something in you starts to feel this feeling. And it's kind of this insecurity, but that's not how you feel it. It turns really quick to kind of anger. And something in you is like, does she think he's better than me? Does she wish she was as rich as that? Does she not see how hard I work? And you see this feeling start to rise up in you of resentment because she's talking about this amazing guy and all the money he makes. And so you get quiet. And she goes, is anything wrong? And you go, no. And she goes, oh, my gosh. Are you feeling, like, threatened, like you don't make as much money as him? You know, and you know how that conversation will go, right? Till 1.30 in the morning, Okay. All because an event happened that was like a Harry Potter port key for you to insecure triggered land. All of a sudden, you're like, okay. Well, this guy, I didn't make this guy up. This was a real guy. His dad literally used to say to him, you're never going to amount to anything. And 
And he does that in his marriage. He always feels not good enough. Now, can we streamline some how they talk about the ways in which they might let each other down? Sure. But the most important thing for him is not to say, that rotten wife, nothing's ever good enough for her. But if he can move to the place, oh, thanks. If he can move to the place where he can get curious about, you know what? I reacted to that, but my reaction to it was sort of like 2 plus 2 equal 10. So where did that extra 6 come from? If you can start asking that in your marriages, you're gold, baby. I'm going to be getting thank you notes from you guys by Christmas, all right? <laughs> so basically, what he's doing is bringing that down the aisle with him. That's what I want you to get and to understand, that... When you have these chronic issues in your relationship, when you feel things trigger you excessively, then I want you to start getting curious about them and thinking, where's that stuff coming from? Good. That's where we're going this weekend, all right? We're doing depth marriage work, and this is the real reason that marriage is hard. This is the real reason that this is a challenge because you're not just dealing with you you're dealing with both of you okay your own stuff your junk your pathology your limitations you're going to do them in your marriage you know the old fortune cookie joke in bed you know you'll have fame and fortune in bed you, you all do that okay right well you will work out all of your psychopathology in your marriage all right and in bed too but you know that's a that's a different show okay <laughs> So we all come to our marriages with this junk and they expect our spouse is going to finally meet that need. I'm going to be good enough or they're going to step all over it. And when we do that, it's going to be a dumpster fire and we're going to have conflict and think we married the wrong person and blah, 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 blah. And I find this to be one of the most, maybe the most important dynamic in marriage. It's not that we have poor communication skills, okay? I can communicate I hate your guts very well, thank you very much, you know? <laughs> <laughs> It's that you have aliens living inside of you, all right? You have five-year-old aliens living inside of you. I tell my clients this. Here's the epicenter of this, okay? I tell this to my clients all the time and draw this out like I'm going to draw it out to you. This is how I want you to begin thinking. Let's see. There. Secret of the universe number two. There are four people in every marriage. There's big you, and there's big her, and there's little you, and there's little her. And you guys actually get along pretty well, you know? I mean, you can have problems, and you can work them out, and you can talk, but then one of you says, you know, that thing. And so he comes in, and he says, ah, oh, meatloaf again? Now, big you might be able to hear that, but instead, what happens is little you hears it. It's like, oh, like you want like cordon bleu here, you know? What is it, you know, you know and, and, and little you then reacts and goes, well, I mean, if you're not happy with what I'm cooking, you're welcome to cook it yourself when you come home. You know, adult you might be able to hear that, but adult you doesn't hear that. Little you hears that, and you're like, oh, my God, you think, after how hard I've been working all day, that I would have the, the emotional resources to come home and You don't understand how hard I work. And, you know, there you go. Now, big you and big her could probably get along pretty well. But it's the little kids that are causing all the trouble. And I want you to recognize that, okay? Now, before I leave this, i got to tell a joke on myself because the first time I ever did this, I wasn't really thinking, and I just drew it, and I drew circles, and all of a sudden, I had a giant eighth grade boy joke. <laughs> so these are squares, people. Do you understand me? These are squares. Am I clear? Okay. Another way of saying it is this. Marriages are like two people, both of whom have half-empty picnic baskets, okay? In other words, 
you have some stuff in your picnic basket. I'm sure it's great. Maybe not pick up caprese salads like what Katie made back here, Katie and Beth, but wow, okay? But we have something we're missing, we're longing. Maybe we feel lonely for a kind of connection or some sort of encouragement or building up or freedom, whatever. So my picnic basket has some stuff, but it's missing a lot, and man, am I hungry. Then I meet little Susie Q over there. And man, does she have a great-looking picnic basket, if you know what I mean, okay? And I'm sure it's all filled with cheeses and wine and fruit and maybe a checkered blanket, you know, for our picnic. I'm, and, and it's just going to be wonderful. She's going to be so full of affirmation and respect. And she actually is when you're dating, right? You know, it's like, oh, you lace shoes for a living? That's fascinating, you know? <laughs> That's what it's like, right? <laughs> And you're thinking, this is going to be great, and she's going to fill me right up, okay? I, I've got some needs. I can feel them. Now, the problem is she's thinking the same thing, okay? She's got kind of a lot of half an empty, empty, empty picnic basket, and she meets you, and it's like, oh, he's mighty cute. He's got a, like a nice-looking basket of goodies there. Like, maybe he cooks, you know? And, if, and initially, you know, she's going, this, he's going to really meet my needs. I can tell, like, for nurture and attention and and like he's going to want to hear me when I talk about how I'm mad at my friend or that thing my mom said, and he's going to really get into that, you know. And initially when we're dating, we're like that, right, guys? We're nurturing and attentive. We write them poems. Written many poems lately, guys? <laughs> Just ask him. I don't know, you know. And, of course, that couple's going to get married, and what's going to happen? Well, after the ceremony, he's going to say, okay, we're married. Let the fulfillment begin. <laughs> Start filling me up with all these things that I'm missing, these longings and wishes. Meet my needs, baby. And she's like, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, I thought you were supposed to meet my needs, okay? Uh, and besides, I only have a half a picnic basket. If I fill up your picnic basket, mine's going to be empty. And he goes, well, the whole marriage was supposed to meet needs. And she goes, yeah, it is. So get busy, buddy. And you can get your own Prosecco, you know, whatever. <laughs> And they both come to the table longing and hoping and wishing, and they both leave needful and disappointed. And we have a phenomenon that we call in Mississippi, two ticks and no dog, all right? <laughs> so here's the secret. Big you and big her get along really just fine. It's these little kids we got to worry about. So one of the most powerful things you can do in your marriage, and the reason I'm doing this talk and this conference is because one of the most powerful things you can do in your marriage is let the fact that you have two five-year-old aliens living inside of you become a very conscious part of your marriage, that you have half picnic baskets become something that you're very conscious about, okay? So good news again. Your spouse is not the bad guy again. The bad guy is the vulnerability and the insecurity and the injuries and the questions and those things that we don't know what to do with, so we live them out on each other, and you're both victims of this enemy. I want you to look at one another. You're both victims of this enemy, so let's fight the enemy as friends, fellow strugglers. You are both, if you're repentant, okay, and we'll talk about unrepentant more tomorrow, if you're like someone who says, I want a better marriage, but I'm still a jerk, you have what I call now, I don't think this was in the conference back then, a Roman 7 marriage. You know, where Paul goes, the thing I wish I do, I do not do, I do the very thing I hate. I want that to be something you say in your marriage. The thing I know you wish that I could give you, I cannot do. I hate that. I want to grow. Just that humility, that's the fifth eye, right? Just for y'all to have the category of, you know what? We're, we both are victims of this little kid injury stuff, and we're bringing it to our relationship. Let's let that be the enemy, and let's be friends, and let's grow together. Together... Together, you actually can fill up the picnic basket. Once you stop fighting over who's going to get fed, you can take cooking classes, okay? Now, I'll just say this as a caveat. By the way, this isn't like that quacky psycho babble you hear about. Let's find out what your mom and daddy did and blame it on them. Hope you're not hearing that. We're talking about software. We're talking about what we learn and what we develop that does impact us, Okay? I want us to know what those pieces are because we all have them. So even our own parents aren't the bad guy. The fallen, broken world is the bad guy. We're all just broken. I just want to learn what to do with that so it stops making us like act like marionettes with one another every time we're triggered, okay? 
So I want to build some categories for how to think about these missing pieces, some categories for what they are and how those deficits play out in your marriage. And let's do that by remembering our four eyes from last time. Uh, what's going on in those empty picnic baskets? What's going on for those five-year-olds? I want you to have these categories again so it can help give you some sort of cubby holes to start thinking, I think, I'm, I think this is really one of my issues that I dump on you, you know, okay? Because the biggest trick is learn to catch it. And I'll tell you more about how to catch it, but I'll give you a preview, and that is you can always catch a little kid, five-year-old garbage thing by the, its intensity, okay? The two plus two equals ten thing that I was saying when I was standing over there, that's the tell, that it's out of proportion. Save that for later, all right? So I want you to catch the stuff, start to know the baggage, and start to engage that. I think Keller says something in his marriage book I really like. He said that marriage doesn't so much put you in conflict with your spouse as it puts you in conflict with yourself, okay? That's what I want to do tonight is put you in conflict with yourself, all right? So let's look at them. Intimacy. Remember, this one was about belonging and connection and sharing your heart and attachment and trust. We called it, can I let you in and can I keep you in? Can I share my heart with you below the surface? Can I trust and hold on to love? All right. God made us, for some reason, he made us to where we have to receive a lot of emotional connection, especially when we're little, in order to thrive. If we don't, something in us kind of withers. We need to be mattered. We need to be close. We need to be understood. All right. Um, Y'all remember those, those, those studies that came out of the Second World War? Kids who were in orphanages, babies. And some of them were dying at an inordinate rate, and they couldn't figure out why. And they realized it was because those were babies were in wings of orphanages where nobody was holding them. They were like giving them a bottle, and that's it. And they were literally ceasing to thrive. It was called miasmus, from failure of human contact. All right, so expand that to an adult, and you realize that a lot of what makes us heal and grow and whole is connection. God calls it abiding not only with him, but with one another. It's fundamental. It's human fuel, okay? So if we have missing pieces or injuries there, we're going to feel it. It's going to be an owie. We're going to feel a longing. And we're going to be longing for someone to fill that back up somewhere, not mentioning any names, okay? But another way to say that is we as children are born and continue to live asking what I call core questions of everybody in our lives, primarily the closest people. And we do that implicitly and explicitly, but children and us as children are always kind of wandering through our world kind of with these questions about relationships and love and connection and failure. And we're kind of trying to read the world and read the people in our lives to get a vibe for kind of how to answer those questions. Questions like, do you... Do, does it matter how I feel about stuff? How big, give me a vibe for how big a deal it is for me to fail. Can you give me kind of a sense of how much I should be concerned about that? All right. Um, is it okay? Do you, want, do you want just good boy me or do you want real me? And we're, 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 our little eyes are watching for answers to those questions everywhere we go. All right. Now, fortunately and unfortunately, we're getting answers to those questions everywhere in the relationships we have. Again, if the parental guilt is rising, shh, we can do something about that, all right? But here's where we begin your marriage therapy. Basic principle of the galactic empire. <laughs> if I don't get good answers to these core questions when I'm a kid, I will continue asking them of everybody in my life, everywhere I go, mostly my spouse. But I'll ask them everywhere. I'll ask them at work. I wonder if they think I'm good enough. I'll ask them in Raleigh. Ooh, are they liking my conference? I'll ask them at church. Does she really like me? Okay. I'll ask them on a train. I will ask them in the rain. I will ask them in a box. I will ask them of John Cox. Okay. I will ask them everywhere. All right. Until I'm trying to get a good answer, and sure as shooting, we're going to ask them 
in our marriage. And if you do that, you see, you're in for a buggy whipping. All right, it's not going to work. And you can be like roof in the house, but something in you is thinking like, are you happy with me? You look bad. Or you're kind of disagreeing with every one of my ideas. Like, what, do you think I'm dumb or something? Or you sound kind of critical. Do you love me, even if I let you down? And we're having this in the background all the time, okay? And now you're not talking about the roof anymore. Somebody's going, well, what's that supposed to mean? You know, and you know how it goes. Now, there's your tell. Did you hear the intensity? That's your tell. That's how we're going to start spotting these areas. Oh, that was core questions. Asking our marriage. Uh, tell. There. Sorry. If you're trying to ask, all right, what's a kid need that I'm bringing in my marriage? And where is it just I'm a, I'm a dude and I want to roof the house? Let's work this out, you know? You can tell by the intensity. Once you feel that 2 plus 2 equals 10, once you feel sort of the anger rise up, uh, somebody really screwed something up for me. Uh, earlier in the week. It was a difficult experience. And I realized that I almost couldn't think straight. I was so angry. And I told my client, I said, I got to let you know that I am really kind of emotionally triggered right now. Like I'm really angry and I'm really a little dissociated. And if I do like a lousy session, I mean, you know, it's on the house. So I don't have to worry about it because I'm not all here. Okay. I could feel that I was agitated. I want you to start learning that sense of touch, taste. Okay. Being aware of emotion is not touchy-feely. Being aware of emotion is like being aware of color. Like, are you emotionally colorblind? And if we are, let's grow there to where you can kind of go, whoa, I am so lost here. I'm going to, like, take it out on this client, and I need to warn them. Or how, what a wonderful thing to say to your spouse. I'm coming in exhausted. I say this a lot. Norman, I joke that I gave at the office. It's all new meaning for me. Um, I'll come in and go, I got nothing. I'm brain dead. I need, like, to eat supper. I need to, like... Be quiet for a minute before I can engage her. It's like, I want to give you a warning, all right? Here's an example. A guy I worked with a while back, a couple I worked with. Um, his father left when he was really young, and it made his mom really depressed. And something in her just shut down. And so their family was this very lonely place. Dad was gone. Mom was sort of emotionally unavailable, and he hurt. So then he gets married. And guess what his wife is like? She's little Miss No Cry Baby's bumper sticker. Okay? In other words, she always wants space. She wants freedom. She wants to avoid intimacy. Now let me ask you. Think like a therapist here for a second. What starts to happen in him when she doesn't want closeness? Does he go, oh, well, that's kind of sad, but we'll work it out. Not a problem. I sometimes need a little space, too. No, he just, you know, he can feel that neediness and the anger escalate. He starts to panic. What's your problem? I mean, do you not love me? You know, and he goes into this intensity. And actually... The more he panics and the more he goes to the intensity, look how much you're not loving me like I want. Guess what she does? She pulls away more, fulfills his worst dream, and they start a dance. Y'all remember dances from the first conference? I do A, which makes you do B, which makes me do A worse, which makes you do B worse, and we're off the races to the old folks' home, okay? I used that term in Wisconsin last year, and they didn't know what I mean, the old folks' home. <laughs> This is North Carolina, though. Y'all know the old folks' home, right? <laughs> Y'all need two ticks and no dog, I tell you, right? <laughs> I did a conference in New York, and I told the guy, I said, are they going to like think I'm like a country bumpkin? And then he said, mm, at first, yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but then they're going to say, this is good stuff, even though he talks funny, okay? <laughs> I'm like, well, y'all are all dressed in black, you know, <laughs> so same to you, all right? So to help this couple here, of course, we needed to streamline some stuff about how they made sense of intimacy, but more so, we needed to make sense of the fact that what he was bringing was not just an adult need for intimacy, 
And what she was bringing was not just an adult fear of intimacy. We need to look at that, okay? Here's an example about me. Uh, Norma wrote a book before, way before I did. Um, any of y'all know Camp DeSoto, Alabama, girls camp? Yeah, Norma's family started Camp DeSoto, and she wrote a book on it. So the kids were little at that point, and she was writing the book, and she would be a mom all day. We'd get the kids down, we'd get the house cleaned up, and she'd start writing and write till 1.30 in the morning. And that was okay for a week or so. And then I start going, uh, you know. So all of a sudden, my wife is kind of gone. And in those days, I was, I was still in therapy in those days. Not that I don't still need it, but um, I, was, I was more like my guy, my example. I was more kind of a, um, do you love me, insecure, how important am I type guy, okay? So my wife is doing all this writing and everything else in her life, and my little parts, my five-year-old's in there going like, I'm no mathematician, but I'm thinking we're at least... Best case, we're third on her list, okay? And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> I'm like, she did not even care, does she? And he's like, no, that's what I'm trying to tell you. And I'm like, she spends all this time on the book and they're not even talking. And, like, you know, so I, of course, approach this by whining and complaining and pouting about it. Chicks dig that, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> anything but, like, asking for what I needed in an adult way, you know? <laughs> Right. Um, so fortunately, I was in therapy at the time, and so I'm like, okay, so I'm totally triggering. I'm not important to her. I'm not a birdie, blah, 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 blah. And of course, she and I had some work to do, and like, how can we organize the book and time for us? And those are adult needs. But mine was 2 plus 2 equals 10. I could feel it, and so could she. And I had some real work to do with some injuries that I had about, am I important? Do you love me? If you choose something else besides me, does that mean I'm second fiddle or third fiddle? That was me, okay? And the more I owned that, the more I could decontaminate my marriage from that. Super important. It actually pushed me to need to grieve some of my injuries that didn't have anything to do with her, all right? But at least now I was fighting on the right field of combat. Get it? I wasn't making this just about my wife, which it was not. I was letting this be about my own insecurity and need, okay? That's what we're trying to do here tonight is to think about what it looks like to decontaminate your marriage from that. Now, could we work on more adult-to-adult closeness? Sure, but that wasn't the issue, all right? So one of the most powerful things you can do in your marriage is start listening for this category of these places where you feel this kind of intensity, okay? By the way, this obviously has application to your parenting. I just jotted this note in the notes when I was going through it because I had a woman this week who's dealing with a teenager separating, wanting space from that southern mom, and the mom's telling me, she's, I can tell she doesn't like me. And I'm like, I'm wondering, I mean, like, of course she doesn't like you. She's 18. But, you know, <laughs> why is this coming up for you? In other words, it was some of her five-year-old stuff, all right? All right, before we leave this, really quickly, the other direction. If we don't get fulfilled in the love department, we go the other direction. That's a bunch of touchy-feely stuff, you know. Touch and emotion, that that ain't the cowboy way, you know. I'm Bond, James Bond. Me, Me Conan, me not need. Me not feel. Me just get rageful and scare everyone in the house, you know. Um... Anyway, that's baggage bond, James Bond, 007, all right? And, and, and usually when we shut it down, becoming needy creates interesting dances, but if you shut down the connecting part of us, you start to see symptoms in other areas. A lot of people who are disconnected emotionally, that shutdown place, you get depression, you get um, addictions come from that, like the wazoo, um, narcissism. This is field day for narcissism, Okay. So, with all these, I want you thinking, how do I start to catch these and decontaminate? Let's look at another one and pick up speed here, because I think you're getting the message here. The other one, identity. Remember last time we said there's more to closeness than just, you know, um, there's more to relationships than just closeness. There's more to relationships than just bath soaps and Adele music. There's also the issue of, like, separateness and individuality and can I be me and can I have power and can I have freedom Well, one of the things we need to also learn in our earlier relationships is that it's okay for me to exist. 
that I can say no, that I can be me, that I can be different from you. And if we have struggles there, blind spots there, we can go a couple of different directions. I'm going to breeze through these a little bit. Then we'll take a break. <clears throat> Maybe I've always lived feeling controlled. Maybe when I was growing up, life was sort of like, if I have an opinion, parental authority wins. Children should be seen and not heard. Dad always alphas. Everybody kind of runs. Don't have an opinion. Don't make any waves, okay? So angry dad feels scary and humiliating. I don't even get to exist. I learn to kind of disappear. And then I marry you. And what's going to happen when you and I have a disagreement? Well, maybe I'm going to go scared because it's really scary to see somebody get upset at me when I have an opinion. So you're going to push, and I'm going to keep giving, and I'm going to keep giving and shucking and jiving to please you. And pretty soon I'm going to be at my therapist's office going, I don't even feel like I exist in this marriage anymore, okay? One of my clients told me a while back, she said, I realized that I gave up myself to make him love me. You hear the identity issue there? Her identity baggage? A dude told me just not long ago, he said, I can't do anything without her getting mad at me. Now, of course, we need to deal with how judgmental and controlling she is. She gets mad a lot. But my question for him is, what is it in you that's so afraid of her anger? What is it in you that goes five years old and mommy's upset? A ton of us men do this, by the way. I think it's a funny thing about us men, because we're like men, right? But all our wives have to do is go like, I'm mad at you. And we're like, I didn't do anything. You know, all of a sudden we're, <laughs> we're five years old and mommy's mad. It's like, what? I didn't. How about some poise, guys? How about some power? How about like, really, you're mad? What's up, babe? You okay? Try that, okay? <laughs> she's not that big. She's not that scary, okay? Or we can be controlling other side. I had a couple once, and this guy grew up kind of as the little prince in his home. He was mommy's little hero and always kind of adored and worshipped, and he was very grandiose and loved being grandiose and kind of pompous. So um, his wife would disagree with him, and he would lose it. It's like, how dare you disagree with moi, okay? Um, and, and what he was doing was acting out a part of him that needed to be adored all the time and kind of worshipped, and she was his, you know, minion. Now, the good news is that he was in therapy. He came to therapy. A lot of the narcissistic, controlling, grandiose, unrepentant people that we'll talk about in the morning, they won't come to therapy, okay? This guy was, and he really started to get, he's like, you know, I really... I really kind of like want her to like bow down and worship me, don't I? And, and he's like, that's not good. I don't, why am I that fragile? And I'm like, boom. And of course, she was just all over him, you know, when he showed that kind of power and humility. All right, um, next, uh, imperfection. We all need some experiences in our development that show us that we could be fallen and love doesn't go away, that's just part of the deal. I mean, how many of us have this problem? Okay? I mean, if it goes well, which it never does, we come out with sort of a feeling of, I can be fallen and you can be fallen, and that's kind of just the way it goes, that's part of the deal. Hashtag human race, hashtag happy marriage, whatever, okay? Otherwise, we go one of two directions, and that is, I'm going to live kind of blaming you, or you're going to live blaming me. Remember blame marriage from the last conference? I mean, this is all over your marriage, right? Blaming your spouse. I told you the number one problem in marriages is that we bring this little kid stuff. The number two problem in every marriage is that we never actually solve our problems or work out solutions to make our marriage work better because our default mode is to spend all of our time blaming one another for whose fault it is. Well, I wouldn't have done that if you hadn't have said so-and-so, so-and-so. Well, I did, I did too say, or, you know, I'm sorry, ladies, to pick on you, but the woman one is, we talked about this, okay? Don't ever argue with her there, okay? Even if you didn't talk about this, there's no way out of that. She's got you in, it's a Gordian knot, and you need to go like, okay, I must have forgotten. Okay, there's no way out of the, we talked about this. That's, that's the trump card. That's the trump. You know that Seinfeld thing that where it's like, I, kids, it's like, I claimed it. Oh, well, he claimed it. You know, <laughs> wife says, well, we talked about this. Like, oh, well, then you, you win. It's like nowhere to go. Anyway, so where do we learn 
all this shame stuff. Well, part of it is spiritual. We're all born under the law. We have a core sense, almost pre-verbal, the sense of being under condemnation. I mean, that's part of what that shame that Christ despised on the cross was to start to destroy and undermine that. That's a sermon, all right? But we can also be taught it. Like the generation that raised my generation parented primarily out of shame. Like if you messed up or disobeyed or whatever, it wasn't just, oh, you get consequences, you know, you're going to lose your Legos. But we're good. The generation that, that raised us was like, I'm surprised at you. I thought we had raised, John, I'm just so disappointed in you. Okay, in other words, you're gonna, you can keep your Legos, you're just going to lose my love, you know. <laughs> so we, we grow up with this real loaded fear of being bad. And so now my wife might want to talk to me about a way and I hurt her, in which I hurt her, you know, no harm, no foul. I was a jerk. She needs to speak to it. But I don't hear it as like, you know, I'm just fallible. I'm like, you know, five-year-old me shows up. You said I was bad. How dare you criticize me? Now, why? Why are we like that? We're saved by grace, right? Well, I'm like this because bad can get really loaded for me. It's really scary. Anybody else got that trigger? Everybody? Okay? Just think what it would do for your marriage for you to recognize that. I have this little part trigger that pops up anytime you point out my flaws. Wow. Wonder why that's so scary to me, babe. I want to get curious about that. Just that would change your marriage. Okay? All right, last one. Let's look briefly at this, and then we'll take a break. You getting this? Your marriage is not the problem. Your software is the problem. The baggage is the problem. And I want you all to kind of have this common enemy. Last one is impulse control, emotional management. Remember that one? Fundamental to being a human and understanding humans is to realize how much the human race is run by emotion. So, did we learn to have the ability to have a feeling without doing a feeling? And our culture is terrible at this one. I mean, all of us are terrible at it. But, I mean, our culture, now what you feel is kind of the new definition of everything, right? Or think about the stock market, you know, stock market variation. Economic indicators, my hind leg. <laughs> it's emotion, it's fear and greed. You know, I'm afraid, let's sell. I'm greedy, let's buy. All right, at least they have the integrity to call it market sentiment. Like, yes, thank you, okay? <laughs> okay, both sides of the political climate now. It's like whether you're like a cancel culture or conspiracy theory culture, you know? Whether you were like, everybody ought to get vaxxed or nobody should get vaxxed, you know? There was, we're driven by emotion. I mean, in 2020, we bought all the freaking toilet paper. <laughs> Who does that? Who does that? Psychosocial development, our culture is about 13 years old, okay? <laughs> We're in junior high, all right? And for us individually, have I developed the ability to have an emotion and look at it as an emotion, or do I do it? Okay, you're stuck in traffic. Do you have the ability to go, whoa, this is really frustrating. I'm actually feeling a little angry. I'm kind of helpless. I feel anxiety that I'm going to be late. Or do we just start cussing and cutting in front of people, right? All right, our inner five-year-olds are terrible at this. So guys, you're driving, you know, and your wife is like, um, uh, honey, turn right up here. And we're like, I know how to drive, okay? You know, I'm not five years old. <laughs> yes, you are, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and you're like turning green, and your wife is like, hey, sun's getting real low, baby. Sun's getting real, hey, sun's getting real low, you know. Now, what just happened? Well, what happened was you felt a feeling, a feeling that was provoked by her offering help, a feeling that says she thinks you're too stupid to get to the church on time, you know, you know, without my help. Poor little fella, you know, and you're like, my forefathers crossed the Alleghenies, you know. <laughs> now, what's happening is your five-year-old is reacting, and you're not able to manage that, okay? 
So some of the reason we act like this is because we're sinners, but a lot of it is because we were literally never taught to do emotional management. Five-year-olds aren't good at impulse control, all right? There's the Fantastic Four, guys, all right? The basic character building blocks for relationships and life and marriage. We talk through some of the ways they can go wrong. That gets infused into your marriage. That's the number one reason that we struggle in our marriage. How these can go wrong, how we do them in the background, and I want you to have these so you can start decontaminating your marriage from that, okay? Let's take a break of 10 minutes. Can y'all do 10 minutes? Because I want all the time I can have with y'all. I want you back in 10 minutes or so, um, and we'll, we'll get back at it. Sweet, thank you. Uh, let me explain my book table. Um, uh, my two books, my book, Setting Parents Free, is basically this sort of model, but applied to like what do kids need in order to develop these abilities. But, like I said, the biggest question is most parents aren't just, like we're not struggling with being incompetent parents. Most of us, you know, we can be as fallen as our children are, but most parents are terrified of that. So the book is sort of about how actually, I mean, if you think about the gospel, to the degree that you are broken, your relationship with God gets better. Okay, and frankly, to the degree that you're broken and admit it in your marriage, your marriage gets better. So guess what? To the degree that you fail as a parent and bring that to your kids in a loving way, that actually helps your kids better than being a perfect parent. That's kind of what that book's about. The, um, the, the one story is I've been kind of a, a, a spiritual hobby of mine all my adult life has been the covenant. You guys who are Presbyterians know the flow of the covenant as it unfolds from Eden to Noah to Abraham to Moses to into the David and the prophets and to Jesus and on to heaven. Like, what is God creating with this redemption? So I have been studying that and preaching it and teaching it forever. And God kind of really got in my face and told me to write it a couple of years ago. And it's probably my favorite thing I've ever done. Um, I think my career is downhill from here. Uh, <laughs> it really is. I'm, I'm, I'm a better child of God than I am a husband. So parenting the marriage book is going to be a dud, you know. Um, we just finished the study guide for it this week. It's with the, with the um, book designer getting laid out. Um, so anyway, back there is self-serve. There's an envelope. You can put 20 bucks in it, or if it's a check or Venmo, the Venmo name's on there, 2160 for the tax with that, if you want it, just self-serve, all right? Um, here below here is my Google Voice number. Now... I bring this to marriage conferences because, I mean, you do a parenting conference and people like follow you to the car with questions. You know, you're like, yeah, okay, so, you know, see y'all. Um, <laughs> but at a marriage conference, some of the questions are twitchy, you know. It's like if you want to ask, like, my husband is like this rageful alcoholic and he's like, you know, hey, everybody, you know. So <laughs> if you want to text me a confidential question, that's a number that I will be checking. When we do Q&A, I will check in with the Google Voice number. Um, don't use it for regular questions like, hey, what are good ideas for date nights? Use it for confidential questions, all right? And I will defer to questions here uh, because I love the body of Christ interaction of questions and all that. But I want to create some kind of uh, a venue, a opportunity for you to be able to ask a question that might be more vulnerable, Okay. All right, we talked about grids and categories and places we have glitches. What are we going to do with them, and what should we not do with them? Our story begins like this. As we said, we come into life without the abilities to do most anything, and God created us to develop those in relationships and to learn those. We learn love like we learn spelling. We learn about these abilities, and if we don't, it's going to leave a mark. And all that happens in relationships. It happens in connection with other people, especially when we're growing up, which is one of the reasons that shrinks talk a lot about your childhood, not because, like, find out what your mom and dad did and blame me ring on them, but we want to learn kind of what your formation, what you learned and didn't learn. Now, if by chance you happen to complete this process, 
and fully get all of these needs met, you would be what we call down in my neck of the woods an adult, all right? <laughs> and this is key, all right? Adults are, by definition, people who have finished the process of getting all their needs met and developing the software system and this whole questions answered and developmental abilities and their needs met and their characters are rocket hot and ready to do relationships and marriage and God and, you know, they're ready to chart a course for adventure and pull up a groove and get fabulous and all the things, you know, that we want to do, okay? The only problem is there's only one guy like that and he lives like in Montana somewhere and he's real unhappy because he's lonely because nobody else is healthy like him, you know? So anyway, adulthood is about having completed these developmental abilities and obviously you can see the problem with that setup. I mean, the problem is that basically None of us have completed Jack, and if you're like me, you have all this stuff oozing out in all the wrong places, and here's our plot point. Anytime we have those incomplete places and those needs, something in us is going to inevitably, inexorably, irresistibly, chronically, foolishly look to our marriage to get it resolved, okay? And if you do that, not only will it not resolve them, you will be toast, okay? The technical word is toast, okay? You will have two ticks and no dog. You'll be projecting all your drunk into your marriage, and it'll be a movie even Quentin Tarantino wouldn't love, all right? And it's the number one mistake I see in marriages, including my own, and we don't even know we're doing it. We just think there's something horribly wrong with our relationship, okay? Now, why? That's what we're going to talk about. Why doesn't this work? I mean, I'm talking about bringing your emotional, unresolved emotional needs. Don't bring them to your marriage. Why not, Cox? I mean, why does this create such difficulty to get our childhood needs that aren't resolved? I mean, can't, why can't we just kind of like move them over to our next most important relationship, your marriage? Kind of like transferring credits from a college, you know? It's like this wasn't quite done, so i got to make up these hours, you know? That should work, right? I mean, marriage is like our most meaningful, rich relationship. It ought to be the place where we can get these needs met. I'm going to tell you why. And I want you to have this category, so maybe it'll help you give up banging your spouse's head against the wall to do it, okay? Remember that developmental story we told of the four eyes that God created us to need and to learn and all that? Well, those childhood needs, right? Well, I don't want to go too fast for you, but God created us to get our basic childhood needs met during childhood. In other words, this is key. God created us to develop love and freedom and forgiveness and emotional management and all that. And what I call, and this is a technical term I want you to take with you, what I call developmental relationships. Okay? That is a special category of a kind of relationship. Developmental relationships are relationships in which someone who has gives to someone who needs. Okay? They have a very specific structure. It's like AC current versus DC current. All right? I have goodies and you don't, so let me give to you so you have. Think about some examples of that. You know tons of them. Parent, child, um, teacher, student, your pastor and you, a therapist and a client, a coach and a player. Okay? Um, a small group can serve as a developmental relationship for each of its members. Something about that group context. And, of course, you and God. Developmental relationships are the kind of relationships, there's plenty of them in our life, in which someone who has gives to someone who doesn't have so that they can grow. Now, boys and girls, notice what's not on this list. <laughs> Marriage is not a developmental relationship. Marriage is a mutual sharing relationship. Marriage is an adult-adult peer relationship. By its definition, by its structure, I didn't make that up. It's apples and oranges. It's peers sharing life, adult to adult, not a, a developmental relationship where I can get needs met that weren't met before. 
Okay? Bottom line, marriage is not a parent-child relationship, though your marriage may look otherwise. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you, you get it now? Right, yeah. Um, Running relationships for adults, okay? That's why you don't see too many, like, eight-year-old girls picking out their china pattern. You know, it's for grown-ups, right? Marriage is not a developmental relationship. It's not designed to repair our emotional deficits. I don't know of anything more important I could tell you, okay? So to the degree that we have any expectation, and we all do, that an adult-adult marriage is going to finally meet a developmental childhood need and fill up all of those longings, we're kind of going against the grain. We're swimming against the current. She's going to need X, you're going to need Y, but I need X. Well, sorry, I need Y. You'll have two ticks and no dog again till the old folks home. It'll look like this. I was seeing a couple a while back, and he has unresolved issues about am I, am I, am I uh, good enough? Like, he feels lots of shame. Like, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, okay? And so he's always pushing his wife, kind of needing her to build him up and tell him he's good, right? And he does some public speaking, and he's always like, well, honey, did you think I did good? Honey, did you think I did good? Right, this isn't me, all right? <laughs> uh, okay, thanks. Now, if, I could get, if you could get Norma to say that. And he's like, do you think I did okay, honey? Or I love you, and she won't say I love you back. And he's like, are you okay? You know? But you hear him, he's trying to get an emotional need met, a childhood question, a core question answered, okay? Now, as you may be learning from me, you can predict to me what his wife is like. What she really needed and missed was a big, strong daddy. She wanted to feel safe and protected, like she didn't have to be the biggest person in the room that she could just kind of relax and fall in the arms of somebody who would protect her. What her tit needs is security and safety and strength. So guess what's going to happen in that marriage? Y'all are learning the John Cox way of thinking now, right? He's begging her to take care of all of his insecurities, tell me I'm good enough, okay? And she's begging him to not need anything and be big and strong and take care of her. Two ticks and no dog, welcome to every marriage, okay? Why? Why does this not work? Because they don't love each other? No, because it's AC current versus DC current. We're trying to get um, a, a, an emotional need, a childhood parent-child need met by an adult-adult relationship, okay? So can your spouse grow in their ability to affirm you? Yeah, that's great, but that's never going to answer that core issue, and I want you to be able to pull that out and know what it is more, Okay. Adult-adult romantic relationships are not naturally oriented to meet childhood needs. Let me say it the sad way. There's no amount of affirmation your spouse can give you that's going to finally make you feel good about yourself. Let them off the hook of that. And let's observe a moment of silence. Bottom line, a romantic relationship should be sort of the fruit of our wholeness, not the resource for it, okay? In other words, it should be about, I'm kind of complete, I got a pretty good picnic basket, eh, I got a lot of problems, but, and you're kind of complete, you got a pretty good picnic basket, you want to go to a picnic? And we can take cooking classes and learn to fill our picnic baskets better. You want to? But you hear me, now we're on the same team. We're both saying, I got this, you got that, let's quit fighting about it why you don't fill me up and go, I need filling up and so do you. That's sad. Let's care for each other in that incompleteness, okay? So marriage is designed to meet adult needs like companionship and connection and that adult intimacy and sharing like we talked about last conference and respect and win-win problem solving like we talked about last conference and, and healthy sadness is part of a marriage. So if, if that kind of closeness and connection isn't part of your marriage, let's grow to, to develop that. That's what the last conference was, all right? But when those reactions turn into chronic disappointments and hurt feelings and barking at each other and 2 plus 2 equals 10, remember that's your tell. I think there may be something going on here, a developmental need that I'm trying to get you to meet 
It's time to back up and look at five-year-olds. All right, I want y'all to have this category. For some reason, marriage is like a magnifying glass to the most vulnerable pathological parts of us. Isn't that right? I mean, you don't act this way with your bowling buddies, do you? You're like, you, you guys don't affirm me. I mean, you see, you see that strike? It's like you didn't even care. You know, we don't do that, right? Right? <clears throat> so... The problem is I want my wife to make me stop feeling insecure, and she can't, all right? So let's talk about what to do with this, and that's how we're going to wound up our evening, and we can do lots of Q's and A's and all that kind of stuff. So what do we do? Number one, we're already doing it. I want you to start discovering these things. L-Y-B, learn your baggage. You and your spouse love each other just fine, okay? Okay. It's these two little kids that are causing all the problems. And I want you learning to develop the ability, and it's going to take practice, and you might need other people's eyes to help you. I did. To start getting curious. Could this be my stuff? Just asking that question will transform your marriage. Do you hear me? Just you saying, maybe this is my little kid baggage and junk. I mean... Have you ever said that in your marriage? Instead of like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with you? That's where we go, right? I just want you to get curious about this, all right? So look for the, so get curious by looking for the added proportionness of it. Um, there. When you start feeling that jealousy or that insecurity, I got a guy right now who's convinced that his wife is cheating on him. And they're sitting there in the room. And I'm pretty close to her. I pretty well know her, and I'm pretty sure she isn't. But he cheated once. And you know the old saying, he who looks behind the door has once hid there. Just saying. And one of the things I'm inviting him to do is to get curious, like, okay, well, sure, let's ask her questions because you're feeling anxiety. But can you also get curious that some of this might be your own fear, your own jealousy? Can you own that some of it might be yours? Just get curious. All right? When we start to see that out of proportionness, that's your tell, all right? I uh, had a client a while back, a couple, and she, was, she would always kind of bully her husband about money. Like, he couldn't, you know, like, buy a new golf club without going, what are you thinking? You're just throwing our money around. And she was kind of reactive like that. And that would always get him into these fights. And to her credit, I mean, I was working with both of them, to her credit, she was willing to start getting curious about that. Well, turns out, big surprise, Like, uh, her dad left when she was little. Her mom had to work two jobs. They were living hand-to-mouth, edge of poverty. Money is terrifying to her. And she went, oh, my gosh. That's like, I live that fear every day. And I take it out on my husband. And it's like, oh, my gosh. That's, I mean, thus endeth the lesson. Okay? How brave and how powerful and how loving. Okay? Here's one about me. Um, when Norma was writing that book, you know, the one that took her away from me in which I acted so maturely, um, she asked me to edit a chapter. And I was an English major. I was going to go on to write several books. So I'm like, I'm glad to do this for you. Now, part of my injury, part of my issues is the third eye. Like, I have issues with am I good enough, you know, issues of imperfection, or in my case, perfection. Um, anyway, <laughs> see, I'll obviously have to resolve this. Um, <laughs> so I go and edit her chapter, and I'm like, there you go. Made a few tweaks. I think it'll help you out. She's like, okay, thanks. And she goes back to working. And I'm like, that's all she's going to say? Like, that, that's it? And she can see my face, and she says, are you okay? And I'm realizing I'm really getting angry. Like, I, I want to go, oh, 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 no. No, Norma, you're, you're welcome. No, you don't need to be so effusive. No, no, it was my pleasure. You know, in other words, I'm getting really angry because she isn't like, I want her to go like put it on the refrigerator, you know? <laughs> Look at what John did for me, y'all. You know, when people come over, you know, they could see it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> 
So anyway, she looked, I'm doing this in my mind real quick, because I'm feeling that 2 plus 2 equals 10, you know, and I'm going, whoa. And uh, she goes, are you okay? Is there anything wrong? And I said, yeah, but it doesn't have anything to do with you. Okay, this is like my mom or something, you know, okay? No, not really her. No. <clears throat> so I want you to start thinking about these things and discovering them, okay? Just to think, I think that really triggered me. I need to kind of figure out what's going on there, help me out and back up from it, okay? So one category is just to sort of think about it and ask and learn. Secondly, I want it to be something you talk about. A huge way to conquer this, to keep it from corrupting your marriage, is to let it be a very verbal part of your relationship, okay? Great topic for date night, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I want you saying stuff like, you know, we both know how controlling my mom is, right? That's not news, not breaking news. I swear that's why I act like such a gizmo when you ask me to help you in the kitchen, blah, 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 and I've just come in. I swear that's it, okay? I'm just spitballing here. I want you to think about this things together. I want this to be part of your interaction. I want you to ask questions and think. Um, Norm and I will literally do this. If we're having an interaction, you hear the question she asked me earlier in that story. We will literally see each other. You can see it on the other person's face. Are you triggering? Is, are you, is something going on? I mean, yeah. I want this to be something you bring up, okay? And I want you to actually talk about this. I want you to ask questions about it. I want you to see your little kid part as being this little dude, little gal, who's all afraid, and yet you can help. Let me give you an example. Uh, a couple of years ago, Norma said, oh my gosh, Callie, my oldest daughter, lives in Nashville, um, 37. Um, Callie and I are going to Paris this summer. I'm like, great. <laughs> All right, you guys got five-year-olds. What am I feeling? You and Kelly are going to Paris? Did you just say, let's go without dad? <laughs> five-year-old is saying that. He's going, dude, are you listening to this? I'm like, yeah, I'm listening to this. He's like, they don't want you going. I'm like, I'm seeing that. Don't rub it in. He's like, they don't like us. I'm like, Yeah. So I'm ready to say, oh, well, I hope you have a great time in Paris without me, okay? That's where we go, right? So I'm catching this, and I'm going, okay, I'm feeling like, okay, little kid me feeling rejected. You don't want me. Back up. I asked her a question. What's my question? I said, yeah, that's great. About the Paris thing, can I ask you a little part question? We will talk like this, and I want you to as well. Can I ask you a little part question? She goes, yeah. I said, are you like... Y'all are going to Paris without me? Is, is that like, did you not want me to go? And she said, oh, no, 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 no. Callie, all of her friends are doing these mom trips, girls and moms. And she said, I want to do a mom trip. She said, you know how you and your dad, me and my dad do trips all the time. Like we go fly jets and do stuff together. We have adventures. She goes, it's like your mom doesn't go on the jet trips. And I'm like, oh, okay. And she responded in this warm, loving way. Why? Because I acted like an adult. People like adults. People like being married to adults. Okay? So here's the secret. If you manage the little kid stuff, that was a real question. I kind of wanted to help him answer it. He's scared. And I want to get an answer. All right? And, 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 and so I asked him, can I ask you a question? You know what your questions are. Back up and think until you can. Take a time out until you can. All right, we'll talk about timeout in a second. Um, by the way, why do we not want to go there? Well, I mean, how weak and needy do I sound asking that question? Again, me Conan, me not need, me not feel feelings, me just scream and yell, okay? In other words, it's, it's kind of vulnerable to ask these kind of questions. Tough. Get vulnerable, all right? It takes, I tell you what real power is, is being strong enough to engage and face what you really are afraid of and feel and bring that to another person in a responsible way. That's powerful. <clears throat> so think of what it would do for your marriage if y'all had this category of understanding 
these little guys and to be able to talk about it and actually be compassionate about it. The way I asked this question was actually a compassionate thing to do for myself. I mean, these are parts of you. There are four people in your marriage, right? Let's take care of all of them, all right? By the way, if you are married to someone who, um, excuse me, just a little teary. No, just kidding. Um, <clears throat> I don't feel feelings. Um, if, you're married to, if you're married to somebody who's not willing to get curious, who hears all this and goes, there's a bunch of psychobabble, I'll yell at you if I want, come in the morning, okay? That's what we're going to talk about, what to do with people who don't care about vulnerability or growth or blah, 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 all right? Um, so hold on, we're going we're gonna to create a context for them to engage in a different way, all right? So understand, get curious, talk about it. Number three, I just alluded to this, but time out. Remember we talked about this in the last conference. There's a problem here, and that is that when we really get agitated, threatened, vulnerable, hurt, uh, feel shame, what happens, even if you think about it in terms of brain chemistry, is that we're triggering back here in our like midbrain, you know, your amygdala or your hypothalamus or whatever it is. It's caveman brain, right? Reptile brain. It's like your choices back here are like fight or flight or freeze. Caveman brain. You know, your options are like run from T-Rex or kill him. You know, that's kind of the sophistication we're, we're dealing with there. Now, once that happens, one of the things we talked about last conference was one of the reasons that a conflict turns into a fight is once that part of us gets triggered and we start acting out of that five-year-old, it's all over but the shouting, okay? Nothing good comes from that, from triggering out of just what I happen to be feeling. You know how Obi-Wan says to Luke, Luke, trust your feelings, right? Obi-Wan is wrong, okay? <laughs> That's why he had to live on Tatooine all by himself, because you, <laughs> you can't maintain a relationship with a woman thinking like that. I mean, you're you getting me, right, right? In other words, what do you do once you're triggered back here? Nothing. You know, these couples will say, we fought till 1.30 in the morning. Oh my gosh, you should have stopped fighting the moment it got ugly. And, and I can time out me? Okay, I think I'm so agitated here, I need to not say anything. And, you know, physiologically even, it takes maybe 20 minutes for your brain to start getting up here to your frontal lobes again. Take a little time out, a little break, just let it go there. You can set time out on your spouse if they're going off. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Whoa, 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 that's really getting hurtful. If you're going to need to be hurtful and kind of cutting to me, I think I need to kind of step out of the room and we can come back to this. You can time out them. But if you're triggered in that part and if you're lost in that part, if you can't discover and talk about if you get lost in it time out's your best your best tool with my clients who go well, we're not very good at this marriage stuff yet I'm like don't worry about that that'll come with practice just get good at time out if you don't know what to do good just stop doing the bad I remember I told Norma once when we were in some of our own marriage stuff I'm like she had done something that really ticked me off and I'm like okay I'm not going to do the bad thing I usually do but I don't know how to do something good yet so all I'm going to do is not do the bad she goes, okay, good plan. You know, can you, can you call one of your nice friends and ask them what they would do? You know. <laughs> anyway, so timeout's going to bias that time. All right, uh, it, it, for you to, it's one of the most underused things in marriage. Um, now it's hard to go to timeout. We've got time for this. It's no fun to go to timeout because. If you're like me, and we're honest, it feels good to be mean. I mean, sometimes I want to make my point with my finger in her face. I want to really let her have it. And if I'm going to swallow that and not act that way, that hurts. I have to sit with that. Let me ask you this. Why does it feel good to be mean? And we'll touch on this some with why is it hard to forgive? It goes like this. Imagine that I've got 10 pennies worth of meanness or shame or anger or hurt or junk inside of me, right? And that doesn't feel good. It's 10 pennies worth of gross stuff. But if I can make you feel really bad or really stupid or call you names or mock you or yell at you or go off on you, it's like I take like 
eight of those pennies and dump them on you. And it actually feels so much better inside of me. I only got two pennies left. Now you've got eight and feel terrible. I got a couple right now and he loves just to discharge. And after he said things she'll never forget, he's great. He's like, hey, baby, you want to go out tomorrow night? And I've taught her to go, are you crazy? <laughs> after you repair what you did last night, maybe. But not until. Now, I dump those eight pennies on you. I feel better temporarily. And we've got the freaking Denver Mint putting out more pennies inside of us, right? So the reason it feels good to be mean and to not go to timeout is because it gets rid of some of our junk and puts it on our spouse. And it's going to hurt to not do that. You'll have to sit with the sorrow and the loss and the anger and the shame and not dump it on them. I'm just going to read you the fine print here, okay? We can come back to that in Q&A if you want. From the looks on y'all's faces, we might need to. Maybe on the digital text line. I wonder what that thing is. I don't see it. All right. Fourthly, grow. You can grow, okay? I have a whole conference on that. It's on my podcast. Look it up or have me back. It's my second favorite conference. It's the How to Grow Conference, all right? It's basically a psychologist looks at sanctification, okay? <laughs> Which I guess this one is too, but um, let's at least broadly look at it. I mean, I do a whole conference on this, and I'm going to give it about 10 minutes, all right? Think about it. God knows that we're not complete, right? And he knows that marriage is not a developmental relationship, right? And he knows we have to have developmental relationships in order to grow, right? And he knows that we still need to grow, right? He's smart. So what's he going to have to do? He's going to have to give us new developmental relationships. And he does. The body of Christ. Our second family. The people of God. I believe the church, I call the church our second family. Your first family was the one growing up. But the reason there's so many each others in the New Testament is not because Paul and Peter and James and them are just telling us to be nice to each other. It's because the way we relate to each other, where do we learn the things that are the core parts of our software? In relationships, in developmental relationships. And what, 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 what the epistle writers are telling us, what Jesus was telling us, what the law was telling us was this is how to relate to one another in a way that helps build a, a heart that's complete and full like Christ. Okay? In other words, the way we relate to one another is actually going to help us heal. So marriage is not a developmental relationship. But the church is. Okay? In other words, our growing up doesn't end in childhood. There's new growth that can happen as we start to bring our incomplete places into the, the relationships with God's people. All therapy is is systematized, strategic sanctification. Each other's. It's systematized, strategic fellowship. What is fellowship? Connection with one another in that kind of developmental relationship sort of way. So you want new growth in your marriage? You want to grow in these places? Stop trying to get them met in an adult-adult marriage relationship and let's begin looking for and becoming. I, I say this everywhere I go all the time at every church I speak at. What would it look like for us to be becoming and looking for a, being a church community in which we can create this kind of growth? This can be a lot of different contexts. This can be good, safe, wise friends even. Okay, people with whom you said, like me and my, my uh, co-owner, my other psychologist who I work with, he and I have this kind of relationship. And I'm like, dude, I kind of need to like talk. And, we, and we'll switch roles on who gets to be in the developmental relationship. Sometimes I give to him, sometimes he gives to me. But the, the, I look for these kind of friends, people who are not going to lead with Bible versing you, people who are going to lead with grace, but people who are going to tell you the truth, people who will stab you in the front. People who keep confidentiality, even from their spouse. If I wanted your wife to know about my drinking problem, I would have invited her out for beers, okay? 
support groups. We're putting a thing in the back of the uh, study guide that goes beyond the Bible questions from the book and asks more vulnerable questions. So you can go more into like, great, at Eden, God addresses Adam and Eve's shame. What are some ways in which you see your life governed by shame? I want to create a group context in which people can start bringing this stuff. And when it meets a new relationship, it gets better, all right? Mentors, older people who you trust and who will tell you the truth and be gracious and loving. A therapist. Sometimes I tell my clients, let's just kind of resolve this issue for you so you quit banging your spouse's head against the wall about it. And of course, your relationship with God. How much does he directly, not, we, we're talking a lot about God's mediating mercies and grace through the body of Christ, but what about his direct relationship with you, the way he loves you, all right? You want better marriages, start looking for and building and becoming those kind of relationships, all right? God created us to live in community, and our culture has turned community into a community of two. You and your spouse. Y'all need a little sweet get-together time, all right? And we're expecting that's going to meet all our needs, okay? It's a stagnant pond, people, all right? We need new blood flowing into that. We need good relationships that build that. I think that God calls us to go to those places first. Learn, grow, heal, and then bring that fullness back to our marriages, okay? So what would it look like to be that kind of church culture? I love to challenge churches about that. I think it's the most important need there is. And if, you, if the church did it right, quote unquote, it put me out of business and I'd be the happiest man there is. Because therapy didn't just get invented like with, you know, the beginning of the 20th century. All therapy is is a relationship in which I'm getting what I need to grow. That's why they're all the each other's in the New Testament. Okay? Don't get me started. I'm going to go all night on that, all right? So, become experts in these growing places. One last thing, and then we'll wrap up and do some questions. Am I saying marriage is now just off limits completely for trying to grow in my little baggage needs? Like you can't go to your spouse at all with the parts of you that are insecure or needful or whatever. No hope. Scratch it off. That's not fair. That's no fun. Come on, Cox. Throw us a bone. Okay. You can bring your baggage to your spouse if, number one, you own it. Now, what does that mean? Own it means saying things like, ha, ah, okay, what happened at that party and the way you talked and what you said about me that completely triggered me, and I'm not sure whether that's my shame or whether you were way out of line, but I need to talk about it because I'm really feeling it. You hear I'm taking responsibility for it? I'm not going, what were you thinking doing that? I'm going, I just really felt a big, like, atomic bomb inside of me, and I'm trying to figure it out, all right? I'm really feeling kind of insecure because of this new job you have and I'm not sure how to make sense of that I have it on my list help me out I got this unappreciated feeling like you don't care about all that I do around here do you appreciate what I do but see I'm owning it as a little part feeling before I'm bringing it okay as opposed to what's your deal okay feel the difference I worked with a, a woman a while back, and she was having difficulty communicating to her husband, but this is how she would communicate to him. Oh, my gosh, what you said just hurt my feelings so much. No, I, I think what he said actually should hurt somebody's feelings, given what he said. But I said, you know, you're coming with such certainty. Like, he's the bad guy. Look at what you said. And you're not taking any ownership. Can you at least own part of this? And I think it'll make it a lot more palatable for him to hear. Can you have some ownership? Could you say, you know, what you said hurt my feelings a lot. And I'm not sure if it's because you were being unkind and cutting or maybe something in me was being too sensitive. I'm not sure which one it was. But can we talk about it? I'm not sure whether it was your mouth or my ears. Can we talk about it? You hear the ownership, you hear the responsibility, and instead of going, well, I didn't, he goes, yeah, we can talk about it. I think I was a little jerky. And he softens, and we take the five-year-olds out of the room. You get it?
So can you feel the difference between just bringing it and taking responsibility for it? Oh my gosh, you make me feel like such a loser. No, your dad did that, okay? Your wife is just triggering it, all right? <clears throat> so you do that and your, your spouse can join your project of growth. Um, secondly, you can bring it to your spouse if you bring it to your spouse second. Okay? In other words, if you're feeling neglected and misunderstood and not appreciated and criticized and all this little child kind of stuff, that's cool, you know, that's legit, welcome to the club. But in order to feel loved and respected and special and whatnot, to get that itch really scratched, I want you to bring it to those other godly resources we were talking about first and help reduce some of the intensity and the immediacy of that. And then you can bring it to your spouse after you have mastered it a little bit, okay? We need the body of Christ people to help us do that before we come to your spouse or your coach, okay? Here's a kind of a superficial example. Um, but Jim, my, the guy I work with, one day a few years back, uh, I had had this terrible day at work, and it was like, ah, everything had gone wrong. And I was packing up to go home, and I literally could feel myself anticipating how good it was going to feel to unload all this stuff on Norma and tell her what a bad day I have and have her really nurture me there. Now, as they said in the Gladiator movie, those of us who are about to die salute you. I'm like, yeah, right. I know how that's going to go. I've danced that Who's Day's Worst War dance a lot. I'm going to be out of gas. I need a lot of tending and nurturing, and she's going to be like, well, get it somewhere else, buddy, you know, because I've let, you know, children, I've been the pediatricians all day, you know, whatever, and we're going to have a fight there. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'm, I was born on a Tuesday, but it wasn't last Tuesday. So I go to Jim's office, and I'm like, dude, can I talk? And he's like, yeah, come on in. So I lay down on his couch. This is one of the perks of working with a shrink. <laughs> and I'm like unloading and bitching and carrying on. And, and he was so sweet, and he was nurturing. And then my phone rang, and it was Norma. And he goes, here, 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 let me answer it. He goes, Jim Brown's office, and she goes, Jim, and I hear him go, oh, uh, yeah, I'm doing therapy on your husband, and I hear, <laughs> I hear her go, good, uh, like, you know. <laughs> but my point is that it worked, because I, he, he like, like, was loving to me and giving to me developmental relationship, he was someone who had, who gave to me, and I came home, and sure enough, she was his like wiped out as me, and I'm like, I got nothing to give, and she says, I don't either, and I said, well, you just want to hang out and kind of be close, maybe watch a Netflix or something, just kind of be the guy, I was like, yeah, that sounds nice, and the, then the junk didn't happen, okay, the five-year-olds were out of the room, okay, we went from demanding to sharing, and if you address that childhood junk, you get the adult love in spades, okay, that's the bottom line here, so basically, our story tonight is that marriage is an adult-adult relationship, romantic relationships for adults. And if you're going to do it, it might be pretty good to have at least one adult present. <laughs> it's like, marriage is like fireworks. Do not attempt without adult supervision, okay? <laughs> so I'm going to be teaching you a lot about marriage this weekend at a deep level. You see, I took you down low, um, but I wanted to begin here tonight speaking to all four of y'all. Okay? The enemy is not your spouse. The enemy is those vulnerabilities and insecurities and wounds that you both carry and you both don't know what to do with and you're both victims of that enemy and I want you to call a truce and I want you to stop fighting and I want you to start learning what it looks like to grow together in those places. All right? Let's do some questions. You got that mic?